Hey everybody, Spaceman Spiff here with another audio commentary. And this is, yet again, another new video in a new playlist, which is as of yet untitled, but I guess once it's posted there will be a playlist title, so, of that playlist. Um, either way though, I've had a lot of requests from, I guess, newer players or players who are returning to the game who haven't played in a long time, who are asking about general understanding of the meta, um, build orders or how to lay out your base, thought processes and you know generally the main matchups you're going to be facing for each race. So I thought I'd try and make something. I'm going to be kind of winging it as I go so bear with me. Hopefully this will be of some interest. I imagine to more veteran players this is probably a lot of rehashing things you're familiar with. But I'm going to go for it and please let me know if this is too basic or if it's not enough or or sorry if it's too much or anything like that. I'm happy to, to adjust accordingly, but either way, here it goes. And, and you can see I've... So I'm not a campaign editor kind of guy. I'm really bad with a campaign editor. I don't even have it set up on my computer. So I just, I did a normal game against a computer, and then I saved it at a certain point, which I have now saved as Elf Tutorial. Please don't actually think of it as a tutorial. It was just the first thing I typed when I was saving the game. So here we go. It's on Knollwood. And I set it up against a computer, and then, as you can see, I, I cheated. I put in all the single-player cheats, so I have lots of gold. I'm going to put in Warp 10 now, so all my buildings will build very quickly. And as you can see, my opponent just has one ziggurat, so there's, there's no opponent in this game. I've just set it up so that I have four bases, and I'm going to be able to talk about each of the opponents that we might be against as an elf player. Okay? So we're going to start over here, and I'm going to assume first we're against an orc opponent, okay? So against an orc, the typical matchup is going to be Blade Master and Torn Chieftain, or Blade Master and Shadow Hunter. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Along with Grunts, Raiders, Spirit Walkers, and eventually Kodo Beasts. And that's the usual thing you'll see from the orc player. From the elf, I think the, the definite main strategy you'll see is Two Ancients of Wind, I'm going for Master Druid of the Talon, along with the Demon Hunter, Beast Master, and then Tinker. So I'm going to talk about the hero choices, the flow of the game, and how I'd lay out my base if we were in that situation, okay? So first off, I'm against an Orc. I'm assuming it's against a Blade Master. It's almost always against a Blade Master. So we want to set up a base which the Blade Master is not going to be able to harass. We want to have our Wisps safe, and we want to have enough space so that we'll be able to build both of our tier 2 structures without the Blade Master or his grunts being able to attack them. So that means we need a firm line that's preventing the Blade Master from getting behind, but we also need enough space for at least two tier 2 structures. So I'm going to build my altar somewhere out here. If an altar is flush against the trees, you're not going to be able to bypass it. Yeah. And I'm going to build a moon well right in here. So now, I'll get my Demon Hunter over here. Yeah, yeah. So now you can see just with those two, Everything has to be directly beside each other with these buildings. If there's a gap, it's no good. But they're beside each other, and my Blade Master is not, or sorry, my Demon Hunter is not able to run south through this area. So that's perfect. On this side, it's a bit more of a gap, and typically against a Orc player, you're going to be using your Ancient of War to creep. So your Ancient of War, let's say, is somewhere out here, right? So that's not going to be part of your wall. Um, You'll have to address that in some way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a moon well here. And let's say you want a wonder, right? So if you get a wonder, you build it right there along with a moon well here. And you've got the perfect wall off. You can also, I just want to talk about this before I do that. With moon wells, see how there's a little gap there? If I were to build right here, that still forms a wall. So my demon hunter won't pass. If I do that between a Moonwell and the Tree of Life, though, the Demon Hunter can pass through. So it has to be Moonwell to Moonwell for that size. Anyway, I'm going to do the other one. So let's say my Wonder goes here and my Moonwell goes here. That's, that's an ideal setup against a Blade Master because my hero cannot get through. But if I need to or the time comes later, I can just uproot my Wonder and now I'm able to bypass. So that's the thing you want to do against an Orc player. You could also do it by building a Moonwell right here. So uh, no, that wouldn't. So you'd have to build a couple moon wells. But the, the difference there is obviously that you can't uproot. So now all my wisps are protected. I'm able to build... I, I want to build tier 2 structures, so actually I'll 
Uh, I don't want to do that yet, but look, there's enough room for an Ancient of Wind there, for there. There's lots of space, right? And my Wisps are all protected. So this is the kind of base you want to get against an Orc player. And now I'm going to talk about Demon Hunter. So you get the Demon Hunter first for a number of reasons, but one of, I think the main one is that, you know, the Demon Hunter is the most versatile and the tankiest hero and unit in the Elf army. He is an agility hero, so he starts with lots of armor, and combine that with evasion, he becomes really, really durable, right? It's hard for any hero to, to really beat him down. He's one of the few heroes in the game who can contend with a blade master in terms of damage output. So you get him for that reason, because also mana burn is phenomenal for locking down enemy heroes. It's great against the blade master early on, it's great against the shadow hunter, it's great against the torn chieftain. It's just, it brings any hero down to a melee combat kind of situation because well, heroes without mana are just big units and the demon hunter is one of those heroes that really thrives as nothing but a big unit right as opposed to say a uh, fire lord who you know is my uh, fire lords maybe a, a questionable choice but any hero that requires lots of mana a mountain king a mountain king with a lot of mana is much more powerful than a mountain king with just bash right a demon hunter without mana is still really really formidable so you get a Demon Hunter because he has sustainability against the Orc Army. And I'm going to talk about the Orc Army now a little bit. If you think about the Orc Army, it's pure health and survival based, right? Grunts, high health. Um, raiders, high health, melee damage. Spirit Walkers, literally there so that they can spirit link and maintain the health between all the units. So it just it makes it even harder to kill the units. And then you have the Shadow Hunter, whose healing wave is incredible at keeping units alive as well. So all of that is about surviving. And then when you think about damage output from the Orc Army, there's not much, right? Grunts don't do much damage. Spirit Walkers don't do much damage. Raiders don't do much damage. It's all the Blade Master. So you just need units that can survive. And the Demon Hunter is so good at that. If you get the Keeper of the Grove, sure, you're able to pick off units in the early game and take out individual units, but... He, he doesn't add any survivability to your army like the Demon Hunter does. I hope that makes sense, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. And that's why, when you do eventually go through and hit Tier 2, um, yeah, it's uh, you get the Beastmaster second. So let's say now you've gone to Tier 2, you were successful in your power creeping, and you've been harassing around a little bit, right? The next thing you want to do, you'll hit Tier 2, immediately, I'm going to throw down my Ancient of Wind, and my Ancient of Wind, even if the Blade Master comes to harass me with a couple grunts, there's nothing he can do about it. And if he tries, then I will just repair my Moon Wells with my Wisps from this side. And he can't do much, right? I pick up a Beast Master. I now have maybe two archers, and I go to harass the Orc base. Because he's in the exact same spot as me, right? He's probably tacking around the same time, and he's trying to take out my wins, or I'm, but I've protected them. I'm trying to take out his bestiaries and his spirit lodge because if you can slow that down and gain the edge with your with your ancient of winds going up uncontested, that's massive. That's massive. So now why why the beastmaster second, right? You could get a lot of heroes. There's a lot of choices, and you know a naga has a lot of merit. But the the difference is the beastmaster offers you so much more um, durability. He's a strength hero. He has high HP, so that means he'll survive longer in these battles, where really the only main source of damage is the Blade Master. And he'll pump out Quill Beasts and Bears, or Hawk if you if you choose to go the Hawk route. But either way, that's more health points on the battlefield. That absorbs more damage that your Druid of the Talon are no longer taking. And um, what else was I going to say? And sorry, the other the other big thing is that when you are going in for this Tier Two harass. Those Quill Beasts with the Beastmaster and the Demon Hunter deal a lot of damage along with two archers. They can take out those tier two structures really quickly. So what you want to do is grab a Staff of Preservation, pick up your Beastmaster for, for wherever. Unfortunately, I happened to pick the Null Wood that does not have any taverns on it. So this is the old version, but you would pick up the Beastmaster. And then you let your Beastmaster absorb more damage, preferably while you're attacking in there. Staff out your Beastmaster and then run away with your Demon Hunter, who you ideally will have Boots of Speed on as well. So that's, I think, the, the reason for the Beastmaster. You tech to Tier 3, 
You throw up your Tree of Eternity immediately on, as soon as you have the resources, you do that along with your hero. And pump out a whole bunch of druid of the town, right? I don't want a whole lot yet. Um, so then once you have tier three, you pick up the tinker and then you shift into a more defensive position. Now you have a bit of an edge, you have your three heroes, you pick up a tinker because same reason as the Beastmaster. Durability. He's got a lot of HP, and he's the kind of hero that even if he dies, that factory still has a lot of health points. And then those those things that the factory pumps out also have health points and they deal damage. It all works in this long, drawn-out battle that you're playing. Because your army is not a lot of damage output either. You're just going Druid of the Talent. So you it's going to be a long fight. You are putting using your heroes to put as much on the battlefield, as much health points, sorry, as many health points on the battlefield as possible to, to work in this long one. And then you're going to use your Druid of the Talents to mostly cyclone the heroes. So you're going to cyclone a Blade Master pretty much every chance you get. You're going to be cycloning a Torn Chieftain a lot of the time if it's there. You're going to be cycloning the Shadow Hunter a lot of the time. And that's mostly it. You don't want to cyclone too many units at all. Shot, uh, Spirit Walkers will have a lot of Dispel ready, so you do want to be able to cast Cyclone more than he's able to cast Dispel. And then just let your heroes wreak damage and micro your Druid of the Talon defensively. I honestly think that's the main way to do it, because as soon as you take out the damage output of the Blade Master and then the sustain of the Shadow Hunter or the damage output of the Torn Chieftain, then you, you, you're way ahead. So you don't want to have your army of Druid of the Talon all with Fairy Fire on autocast. You want to definitely turn it off and maybe leave it on maybe two or three and let the rest just pool their mana so that you always have Cyclones on hand. The, the last thing I want to talk about is always staying under 50 food in this kind of situation. You don't want to have 60, 70 food Druid of the Talons unless you have an expansion up. You can stay at 50 food with your three heroes and hopefully outlast them. Just... Keep, keep trading blows and keep the Blade Master in the air. So that's what I have to say about the typical orc strategy. The other one you might do is two Ancient of Lores first and two, instead of two Ancient of Wind and do the tech later. In that situation, you could go Naga second because you don't need as much sustainability on from your heroes because instead of Druid of the Talon, which are very weak, you're going Bears and Dryads, which have more health and are better able to survive. So in that situation, you can get away with going in Naga because Rejuvenation works well with the Naga, because you're able to, you know, just defend her more, um, and, and with your army. Yeah, so that's it. Typically you'll see a Torn Chieftain more when you're going Druid of the Talon, because Shockwave's good, and typically you'll see Shadow Hunter more against uh, Ancient of Lore strategies, because that's where Healing Wave and Hex become a little more effective. Anyway, moving on, we're going to go on to the next main matchup. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to assume this time we are against a... Uh, let's do Undead next, okay? So against an Undead player, there's a couple things. What are you expecting? Either a Death Knight and Fiends, or maybe a Death Knight and Ghouls with a Death Knight Harass. Either way, it's going to be leading into probably Fiends and Frostworms, or Fiends and Destroyers. You're going to see statues. You'll probably see the Undead nuke of... Death Knight, Lich, and then the third hero, there's some variability, but I think these days the main one is probably Dark Ranger, but there, there is definitely variability there. So against an undead, we're not afraid of too much, too much like hero harassment or our structures coming down at tier 2, right? It's not like a Blade Master and a couple grunts are going to come in and start harassing our wisps. If a Death Knight comes... Ghouls and skeletons can fit through the gaps in our buildings, so he's still going to be able to get behind our base. Fiends can outrange a lot of our buildings, so they can move up close and still attack some some wisps or something. So it's not like we don't want to wall off against undead. Against undead, we want a more open base where we're able to maneuver around a lot and, and poke and prod through their army. So I'm going to build like there. I'll build my moonwall here. I don't even think about it too much because all you really need is space. I think. So then, again, you're probably Ancient of War Creeping, so let's put that one way out there, because we're Ancient of War Creeping. And then I'll throw another Moonwall here, and, you know, eventually my Hunter's Hall here, maybe a Wonder here, another Moonwall, and you tack, right? So this kind of fight, or base, is better against an Undead, because if a, let's say, 
a bunch of ghouls and a death knight come to harass. Let's say they're let's go with the aggressive typical strategy none dead would do first, which is death knight and ghouls comes to harass you. It's harder for him to surround you because if you're using moon wells in this kind of base and your hero grabs a moon well, he only has to surround you here and he has to put pressure on this and there's not much you can do about it, right? If there's fiends and ghouls attacking this and your hero's in between, that's not a great spot. But here, if there's fiends and ghouls attacking this or you're defending, you can attack and then run around here and the ghouls chase you or the fiends focus you and you pull back. You go this way and your tree is all of a sudden hitting them, then you heal up here and then you can cut around. And this is really what you want to be able to do against an undead. It's much more effective against undead to have this. You don't want a boxed in base. Um, you know, your wisps are still vulnerable. If a death knight wants to run through, he's going to be able to. But like I said before, ghouls and skeletons are going to get through this base no problem anyway. He's just got to get one or two hits and a death coil on a wisp and it's still dead. dead. So this is definitely better. And this is why... Well, okay. Um, um, so then you, you typically... I'm going to go into hero choices now against an undead. You would typically see a demon hunter. The other major option would be warden, so I'll talk about both. The advantages of the demon hunter are the exact same as I said against the orc player. Um, his durability, his versatility, his ability to mana burn and take any hero down to his level. So the Death Knight with ma is very mana dependent. The Lich is very mana dependent. Even the, the Dark Ranger is mana dependent. Mana burn is great against statues. He's just he's a solid hero. He's safe. He can absorb a lot of damage. You know, against the Undead Nuke, the Elf doesn't have a better, better hero. The advantages of the Warden, though, is damage output. The Warden is much more susceptible to the nuke. I feel the Warden requires a higher amount of... Uh, you have to pay a lot closer to attention to a Warden. You have to really be careful about your movements. But there is just so much damage output in a Warden that um, the, the undead army can just fall apart to it. So that's <clears throat> why you do see a Warden a lot of the time. And when you see a Warden, you also see a lot of moon wells because the warden is such a mana dependent hero so you'll you know I'll, I'll pump up to 50 food very quickly if i'm going for warden first for that. with a demon hunter you can do it a little more um, casually you don't have to get those moon wells down quickly but if you're a warden it's just so helpful to have that extra access to health and mana more so mana so you you really want to have that kind of base and this is why i'm sure most of you are if you look for it, you'll find it. You've seen replays of undead players who do a Death Knight and Ghoul Rush against a Warden, and it looks like they've got the game in the bag, like they're just overrunning the, the Elf player. But the Warden survives for long enough to get level 5 and just keeps dancing around and picking off kills. And the, the reason a Warden is able to do that is because of a base like this with lots of moon balls. Because the Death Knight and Ghouls start putting damage on you, but you can attack once or twice, heal, run around here, attack once or twice, your tree does some damage, run around here, attack, shadow strike, fan of dives, get some more mana, grab an item, move over here, do that, heal up, start building a moon well way out here, and just keep kind of re repeating that cycle, you can really, really deal a lot of damage. So this is the base you want against an undead, those are the two main heroes you'll see against an undead, um, you'll eventually move into tier two. I think against Undead, you almost always see lores. It's never an Ancient of Wind Tier 2 build. The second hero, if you go Warden, you usually stay with just Warden because you want that experience to pile up as quickly as possible so that your Warden can just get out of control. But if you go Demon Hunter first, your likely second hero is going to be a Naga Sea Witch. One of the main reasons for that is the, the mid-game presence she gives you. You know, the Beastmaster, sure, he's got a lot of health points, but... He's not going to help you win in these quick battles where it's all about nuking one hero down and taking a huge edge, right? He's not able to do that. Sure, he survives a bit, but he can't control a battle like a Naga can, especially with the Demon Hunters. Demon Hunter brings them down to like a unit-on-unit -unit battle, and the Naga slows the enemy hero down, which the Demon Hunter can absolutely capitalize on. So the Naga just gives you that mid-game presence so you can really start pushing the undead around when he's got a death knight and a lich and four fiends and a statue. It's just that that's so much more powerful than a demon uh, beast master or something like that. Um, 
You know what, I also, quickly going back to the orc base, another reason the Beastmaster is great compared to an elf hero is that you hit tier 2 and you get him immediately. If you hit tier 2 and then start researching a Keeper of the Grove, you have to wait that extra build time to get that second hero, so your harassment is delayed or weak by one hero. If you get the Beastmaster as soon as you hit tier 2 and go to the enemy base, then you might have your hero out before the Shadow Hunter, and that gives you that extra edge, that extra oomph a couple seconds earlier. Um, okay, back to Undead, you then tech to tier 3 when you have wood, make sure you have a lot of wisps for wood when you're going lures because it gets heavy, and you're going to have to use your discretion. Some games you're going to go more dryad heavy, some games you're going to go more bear heavy, um, honestly some games I, I tend to not even go bears because I have a lot of trouble microing them against frost worms and destroyers and the undead nuke, and dryads are immune to, to magic, so it's... You know, you, you have to use your discretion, but that's generally what you'll see. A lot of Staff of Preservation play. You definitely, in most matchups, in all matchups, if you can afford a Norba Venom on your Demon Hunter, you want to pick it up because he's just so solid. But that's typically how I think the Undead game will progress. Uh, moving into, let's do Human now. So Human, uh, Human, I think you want the same thing as against an Undead. If a human's pushing you, you don't want to be stuck against a wall. You don't want him to be able to force the fight on you right here and, and just keep you back and you pinned against your wall. You always want to be able to move back and buy more time and use your moon walls and everything. So you want another base like this. I'm just going to throw it together really quickly. Like I'm just literally my Ancient of War is over here for the power creeping. And I'm going to build another moon wall here and a moon wall here. Let's say my wonder goes there. Hunter's all here. Eventually attack. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Maneuverability. If he, if the human comes at me here, I can heal, I can deal some damage, I can pull back. The footman can't do a whole lot about it, right? If he comes at me here, I do the same thing. That's the kind of setup you need. So this, even with these bases, you almost never need ancient protectors. Don't go them unless you have a very specific reason. Because this is, with this base, you're set up to defend. You should be able to hold a lot of early pushes with this. This is the kind of base you want against a human tower rush, because that's a common thing to see as an elf player. If he has this, and he comes, he'll set up some towers maybe in here, or he'll set up his towers here if he's coming from the east side. But then he's got a, you know, you can do your push and pull. You can attack here, come into tower ranger range, pull back, heal up, wait a little bit, do some chopping, move back into tower range. If you're on this base, you're here, he sets up his towers here. Now all of these buildings are under siege. You can't pull back anymore. You can't do much, right? If he sets up his towers here, you can always pull back. There's only ever going to be one or two towers in range unless he sets up like here, which is going to be a lot harder for him, right? So this is the base you want against a human player. This is the base you want if you're going to try and defend against a tower rush, against the tier 2 tower push with a bunch of casters this is still where you want to be where he has to you know he can't have your whole base under one line of towers he has to march the towers forward or creep the towers forward you know what i mean so this is what you want um you know against a human player you typically are going to see a naga second as well for the same reasons as against an undead it just gives you that mid-game presence that's really important and really where the human player is a there's going to be a short period where the human player is weak when he's trying to build his arcane sanctums, and then once those arcane sanctums come online, the human player is going to be very strong and very hard for you to deal with. So you, you really, really want to be able to move into <clears throat> the second or the tier two strong, and Naga helps you with that. Um, let's see. You're typically, I guess, unless the human does the tier one tower push, the human could do the tier two tower push. The human could do a just a fast expand, I guess that's the main third one. In which case, you still want this base. You're going to power creep with your Ancient of War, and then you're going to go harass, deal as much damage to the peasants as you can, try and delay any tower uh, uh, expansion going up. But don't overcommit. Don't lose the game trying to take out the expansion. If he gets it up, try and expand yourself. Try and exploit your tech advantage and have bears up earlier. Try and you know get any edge you can. Uh, Panda is also strong in this matchup. It forces 
a a lot of spirit breakers, which are reasonable. They do okay against bears, but bears also do well against spirit breakers. So it's it's a toss up. If you like doing that battle, Breath of Fire is very powerful against the casters, but it's weaker in the mid game, stronger when your heroes start leveling up in the big battles. So use your discretion there. Either way, you definitely want dryads and bears. That's the go-to strategy against human. If you throw up Ancient of Winds, do it later, and you might use it to get a couple hip hippogriffs if there's some aerial threat against undead as well. Hippogriffs, you might mix in if there's some aerial threat or if you're dealing with the zeppelin. But for the most part, you don't go Ancient of Wind against human very often. Sorry, fairy dragons as well. Very effective, but if you're on one base and you're capping at 50 food, you have to be really choosy with the units that, that make your army. And if you're trying to go bears, riots, and fairy dragons, you're going to be a little bit strapped, I think. All right, last race is elf. And against elf, there's a little bit, it's a little bit different. So you could want a base like this, or you could want a base like this. It depends on what you're against. So there are two main strategies. I think for sure the main one you'll see is Demon Hunter, Dryads, Bears, right? That's the main strategy you're gonna see. Naga second into the standard. Exactly what you, I really explained against Undead and against Human. You see that a lot. You see the Demon Hunter because he's great against the Warden. He's great against a Keeper of the Grove. He's solid against a Priestess, like Mana Burn doesn't do great against a Priestess, but he does more damage in a battle, one-on-one -on -one at least, than a Priestess of the Moon does. And um, a Demon Hunter deals with an enemy Demon Hunter about as effectively as, as any other hero, right? So that's a safe pick, he's durable, he's strong, he's, he counteracts a lot of other heroes, so if the other elf tries to do something funky, like panda first, then mana burn really is, is dominant and, and I feel like the other elf is playing from a significant disadvantage from the get-go. So Demon Hunter is the main one you'll see there even. The other option you'll see is Priestess of the Moon and Mass Huntresses. And if you're against Priestess of the Moon and Mass Huntresses, then you want a base that's more walled off. Maybe not quite like this because your main is still exposed, but I think you want something that's honestly like... I'm gonna go one, two, my altars here. there. Uh, this here. This is a massive wall, so <laughs> use your discretion, right? I can't, you won't be able to do this in every game. But by do, having a base set up kind of like this, now the a big play by Priestess of the Hun, Moon and Huntresses is to run in and kill your main really quickly. By doing this, it blocks off any, any attempt at doing that. Uh, you could also do this against Bears and Dryads, but I don't think it's as necessary. Against Bears and Dryads, you like to be able to pull a little bit. This base is clunkier, and it gets in, if you get into a really... Uh, if, if you're in a crisis management situation, this is a hard base to use. If, if you're in a crisis management, you'd much rather be able to move around and push and pull. So I think against Bears and Dryads, you want it more open. But against Huntresses, it's good to have some kind of protection because they want to try and take out your main. That's a big play. Um, so... Either way, you're, you're going to do this, you're going to go into tier 2, set up two lores, put them wherever, you're going to get dryads and bears, and that's the usual thing. Um, again, use your discretion, sometimes you get more dryads, sometimes you tech straight to tier 3 and go straight for bears, it depends on the flow of the game, who's ahead, if you're beating them in tech, if you're behind in tech, like there are so many things to consider. So you'll have to think about it, but again, typically demon hunter and then naga is what you're going to see. Sometimes you'll see demon hunter and then keeper of the grove. Keeper of the Grove is, you know, Entangling Roots gets countered by Abolish Magic. The Tree Ents are, are pretty good. They're okay. But it's just not like... It's not going to turn in... I don't know. It's not going to happen very much in an Elf versus Elf. Plus Abolish Magic still counteracts them. You're going to be pressed for mana if you're against a Demon Hunter. And he's vulnerable. The, the only reason you would get a Keeper of the Grove second, really, I think, is Thorn's Aura. Because if it turns into a long game with big battles against bears, or sorry, bears against bears, then Thorn's Aura is amazing, right? It's almost like Vampiric Aura. I don't know how the numbers stack up, but, you know, if, if you have that edge in a big battle of bear on bear, then that's big. But typically you'll see the Naga second, and it'll evolve from there. Again, get that Orb of Venom on your Demon Hunter. Use a lot of Staff of Preservation. And, and good, good uh, 
food management or upkeep management, of course. So I think that's some... No, no, okay. If you're going Priestess and Moon Huntress is the other alpha mirror kind of strategy. Um, I'm not going to talk about the specific build order. But you're going to have a little bit more open base because typically you're going to be the one in control of everything. So if you're... You know, you can have something like that. Your Huntress all here. You always want two wars. And... Priestess of the Moon. Your base doesn't matter as much if you're going Priestess of the Moon Huntresses because you're assuming that you're taking the fight to them and you're controlling the map. You're probably not going to be fighting in your base, and if you are, well, if you are, then there's something weird going on. But Yeah, so I think, I think that about covers it. I hope this is kind of what some of you were looking for. I know I didn't talk about everything. I haven't talked about some of the units and heroes that aren't in the meta, and that's something I would like to do as well. But... Yeah, so let me know what you thought of this video. Let me just quickly check to make sure I covered everything I wanted to. It looks like I did. Yeah, I wanted to talk about some of the race advantages. I guess I bypassed that. Maybe I'll do it in another, in another video. But thank you for watching. Again, let me know if this was of any interest to, to you, if this was boring as hell. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, questions, comments, criticisms, welcome. Like the video if you liked it. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day.